Goodbye to all of you. Goodbye on the count to all of you. On the count of three. I will be that story. I will be that story. For years and years, and it doesn't bother anyone. On January 22, 1987, numerous television stations across Pennsylvania aired taped footage of a public suicide on their evening and afternoon broadcasts. A man speaking at a press conference had taken his own life in front of the rolling cameras. It was tragic and it was graphic, and Pittsburgh's WPXI, Philadelphia's WPVI, and Harrisburg's WHTM would re-air that footage, completely unedited, during the news cycles. This decision received strong criticism from the public, as you would expect, and a lot of young people were exposed to the footage. The stations that decided to broadcast the unedited press conference slash suicide defended their actions by stating that this was a newsworthy event concerning an important public figure, and he was important. He was also in the midst of being investigated by federal prosecutors. He was Robert Bud Dwyer, and though his dramatic final moments may have overshadowed the rest of his life's achievements, there have always been those who have touted his innocence, strength of character, and ultimate dismay in a system many were convinced was flawed. This is the story of Pennsylvania's Bud Dwyer. Born in Missouri in 1939, Bud Dwyer would grow up in Crawford County in northwest Pennsylvania. A graduate of Meadville's Allegheny College, he was involved in the community and was known as a football coach and history teacher at Cambridge Springs High School in Erie County. Dwyer became involved in politics while in his early mid-twenties, inspired in part by a summer spent in communist Poland. At the age of 25, he was elected to serve in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. In 1969, he was re-elected to the position for the 6th District, representing parts of Crawford and Erie County. His first term, if I remember correctly, uh, was before these districts were redrawn, and he was representing Crawford County solely. Dwyer would serve continually in this position from 1964 until 1970. By 1970, he had been elected to the Pennsylvania State Senate's 50th District, and now was serving all of Crawford and Mercer counties, as well as parts of Erie and Warren. He would remain a state senator from January 1971 through 1980 when he was elected to the office of Pennsylvania State Treasurer. By all accounts, Robert Bud Dwyer was well-liked in the community. He seemed to be a decent person and drew votes from both his party, the Republicans, as well as the Democrats. During his initial run for state treasurer, he twice won the office, Dwyer was running against Democratic contender Robert P. Casey, who is not related to the well-known Robert Bob Casey Sr., who would later be a governor himself, and his son Robert P. B. Casey Jr. was state treasurer from 2005-2007 and is currently, at least at the time of this recording, a United States senator. Regardless, Robert P. Casey, not related to Robert B. Casey, and that's who Dwyer was going up against, and he and his campaign team, fearing the awe-inspiring power of name recognition in elections, decided to launch a successful, albeit odd-sounding campaign based around the slogan, Casey Isn't Casey make sure that any half-informed voter wouldn't be aware that Robert P. Casey was an ice cream parlor owner, high school biology teacher, and not the well-known then-state senator and auditor general. He would not become governor of Pennsylvania until 1987, our Robert B. Casey. Sorry if that's all confusing. Regardless, Robert P. Casey lost, and Dwyer was sworn in as the 30th treasurer to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in January 1980. In this position, he would go on to modernize the state coffers, not only computerizing them, but also uh, making accounting systems that not only saved the Commonwealth money, but also allowed for better, improved tracking of funds and whatnot. Here's where things start to get dark. For the better part of three years in the 1980s, Pennsylvania education employees, public school employees, and state college employees were overpaying their social security taxes. It was a blunder and the Commonwealth began taking bids from accounting technology firms in an effort to sort out the mess and refund the employees. 
1984, Computer Technology Associates Incorporated CTA, would be awarded a contract worth over four and a half million dollars. Then Governor Dick Thornburg would later receive an anonymous missive which alleged that there had been kickbacks and other illegal acts which led to the contract going to Computer Technology Associates. It was also noted that another firm had put in a bid to do the same work for less than one and a half million dollars. Upon the revelation that kickbacks may have been a factor in awarding of the contract, and a federal investigation began, Dwyer's office nullified the contract. This would eventually become known as the CTA case, though this would soon be forgotten following the dramatic conclusion of Dwyer's post as state treasurer. In May 1986, a federal grand jury would indict both Robert Dwyer and Robert Asher, the former Republican committee chairman, of accepting bribes worth $300,000 in return for seeing to it that Computer Technology Associates would be awarded the contract. By spring of 1986, CTA was no longer in business, and its owner, John Toquato, a Harrisburg native, was already serving a four-year prison term in the state of California as a result of other challenges and charges that came from the investigation into the CTA case. John Torquato Jr.'s father is purported to have mafia connections and there are some who say that he ran numerous illicit operations in southwest Pennsylvania. Regardless, Torquato Sr. was the chairman of the Cambria County Democratic Party for nearly 40 years. That was, until he was sent to a federal correctional facility in Kentucky after he was found guilty of conspiracy to extort $80,000 plus from PennDOT contracts. John Torquato Sr. was also charged with multiple counts of mail fraud as well as having ghost employees on the books who whose pay would go into his own pocket. In short, the Torquato name was tarnished before the 1980s even came about. John Torquato Jr. was a smooth-talking confidence man in his own right, and people who know him have stated that he would lie when the truth would ultimately be better serving. Throughout the course of the investigation, Dwyer maintained his and his office's innocence. He released public statements stating that he was looking forward to facing his accusers in court. In 2010, a documentary came out several years in the making titled An Honest Man, The Life of Arba Dwyer. The film goes on to examine the claims of Dwyer's innocence and features touching and poignant interviews with Dwyer's two children as well as his widow shortly before her own death. Though the film has been accused of being one-sided, there are certain troubling aspects and possible breaches of ethics that ought to be considered when telling the Bud Dwyer story in full. I mean, Dwyer was widely perceived as a person of integrity. and wide in a way that is not likely for politicians. It is said that Governor Thornburg despised Dwyer following Dwyer's public refusal to pay for Mrs. Thornburg's travel expenses with taxpayer money, as well as billing Thornburg on behalf of the Pennsylvania State Police who were transporting the governor's children back and forth to school in Massachusetts. He is purported to have referred to Dwyer as a bumpkin and supposedly made vague threats about getting him. Some suggest a conspiracy in which there was no anonymous letter to the governor's office or that Dwyer named by Thornburg himself. The United States attorney in charge of the prosecution, James West, has gone on record acknowledging that no money, not $300,000 nor $1, ever changed hands and that Dwyer had only agreed to take a bribe, which is plenty guilty on its own. During the trial, which was held in Williamsport, CTA's owner, John Torquato, as well as his company's attorney and friend of Dwyer, William Smith, testified that Dwyer had taken money. Smith has since repeatedly gone on record stating that he had lied under oath and that he was made to feel that his own life, and more importantly the life of his son, was being threatened. Throughout the trial against him, Dwyer maintained his innocence and refused to accept a plea bargain. Those around him have said in interviews that Bud was too trusting, too naive, and caught up against forces that wanted him out and would find a way by, to do so by hook or crook. 
Family members report that Bud's entire personality began to change through the course of the trial. As it dragged on, depression became him. His lawyer expressed concerns about the possibility that Bud may be having a suicidal ideation. On December 19, 1986, it was announced that the federal trial had concluded. After four days and 20 hours of deliberation, the jury found that both Bud Dwyer and Robert Asher were guilty of all the charges against them. People who knew Dwyer were shocked, and he maintained his innocence even in the immediate wake of the conviction. Dwyer also stated that he was going to continue to serve as state treasurer until he was able to appeal or his sentencing date, which the governor confirmed was his legal right. The sentencing was to occur the following month. Dwyer was looking to spend several decades in prison, as well as the loss of his pension for his role in the CTA case. Meanwhile, Judge Murr, who presided over the case, reduced Robert Asher's sentence to a year in prison and a fine. Asher was allowed to return to politics and maintain his pension. According to media coverage, this leniency was motivated by a letter-writing campaign that spoke of Robert Asher's importance to the community. On January 22, 1987, the day before Dwyer was to be sentenced, his son drove him to work where he got out and prepared for a press conference which he had orchestrated. Everyone assumed that he would be announcing his resignation. A snowstorm was happening outside. With the press assembled and the cameras rolling, Robert Bud Dwyer began his final statement. He maintained his innocence and spoke about the need for a real justice reform so that real justice could be had in the United States. He also expressed a desire to get rid of the death penalty and publicly regretted any involvement that he had had with it. When it came time to read the final page, he paused, stating that he had not made enough copies for everyone. He then turned to his press secretary, Duke Horshack, stating that he could go make copies. He continued, I thank the good Lord for giving me 47 years of exciting challenges and stimulating experiences, many happy occasions, and most of all the finest wife and children any man could ever desire. Now my life has changed for no apparent reason. People who call and write are exasperated and feel helpless. They know I am innocent and want to help. But in this nation, the world's greatest democracy, there is nothing they can do to prevent me from being punished for the crimes I know I did not commit. Some who have called me have said I am a modern day Job. Judge Muir is also known for his medieval sentences. I face the maximum sentence of 55 years in prison and a $300,000 fine for being innocent. Judge Muir has already told the press that he quote, felt invigorated when we were found guilty and he plans to imprison me as a deterrent to other public officials. But it wouldn't be a deterrent because every public official who knows me knows that I am innocent and it wouldn't be a legitimate punishment because I have done nothing wrong since I am a victim of political persecution. My prison would simply be an American gulag. I ask those who continue to believe in me to extend friendship and prayer to my family, to work on tiring for a creation of a true justice system here in the United States, and to press on with the efforts to vindicate me so that my family and their future families are not by this injustice that has been perpetrated on me. We were confident that right and truth would prevail and that I would be acquitted and that we would devote the rest of our lives to working to create a justice system here in the United States. The guilty verdict has strengthened that resolve, but as we've discussed our plans to expose the warts of our legal system, people have said, why bother? No one cares. You'll look foolish. 60 Minutes 2020, the American Civil Liberties Union and Jack Anderson and others have been publicizing cases like yours for years and years and it doesn't bother anyone. Dwyer then called for his aides Bob Holsey and Don Johnson among them and passed them envelopes containing letters to his two children as well as his wife and the new governor Bob Casey. There was also an envelope that contained organ donor information and funeral arrangements. Having passed these out, and with some members of the media packing up, 
Dwyer pulled out a large manila envelope which contained the 357 Smith & Wesson revolver. He told people to stay back as the panic ensued. Many tried to plead with him, including Duke who stood to his side, blocked by a reporter. Warning people to stay back because the gun could hurt someone, Dwyer placed it in his mouth and fired, immediately dropping to the floor. He was pronounced dead half an hour later by medics, but his death was most likely instant. Duke Korshak, the press secretary, stood between the reporters and Dwyer's body, shouting at everyone to get out and turn off the cameras and to call an ambulance. This was the last page of Dwyer's prepared speech, the one which he was not able to read. I've repeatedly said that I am not going to resign as state treasurer. After many hours of thought and meditation, I've made a decision that should not be an example to anyone else because it is unique to my situation. Last May I told you at, that after the trial I would give you the story of a decade. To those of you who are shallow to the events of this morning, I will be that story. But to those of you with depth and concern, the real story will be what I hope and pray results from this morning. In the coming months and years, the development of a true justice system here in the United States. I am going to die in office in an effort to see if the shameful facts spread out and all their shame will not burn through our civic shamelessness and set fire to the American pride. Please tell my story on every television and radio station and every newspaper and magazine in the United States. Please leave immediately if you have a weak stomach or mind since I don't want to cause physical or mental distress. Joanne, Rob, Dee Dee, I love you. Thank you for making my life so happy. Goodbye to all of you on the count of three. Please make sure that the sacrifice of my life is not in vain. Many have wondered why he did it. Had he just reached his breaking point? Was he trying to control how his life would end? The most likely event is that Dwyer was trying to provide for his family as, upon sentencing, his charges would require him to forfeit his state pension, which he had been earning since his earliest days as a public school teacher in Cambridge Springs. His family's finances were already in trouble because of two years worth of trial preparation. Again, by dying in office, his wife and children would be able to continue to collect his pension. But there's also the fact that Dwyer sincerely hoped that his public and dramatic suicide would be the catalyst for a major conversation, investigation, and overhaul of the American criminal justice system. My initial stance is that Dwyer is probably not entirely innocent, but was raked over the coals by an overzealous system motivated perhaps by parties that did not much care for Dwyer any longer. That may sound a bit conspiratorial to some, but so be it. That would certainly not be the first time that an overzealous criminal justice system strong-armed a conviction. I mean, there are places that still utilize polygraphs, and that's nonsense, and really, well, really, that's another conversation. Regardless, Dwyer's final intentions were overshadowed by the conversation that did occur in the wake of several television stations' decision to air the suicide on that afternoon and evening's newscast, which many children, young children even, home due to the snowstorm, saw. So the conversation went from the intended discussion of whether or not the justice system went too far to did the media coverage go too far. And because of that, the footage was seen across the world, which means that regrettably, Dwyer may never be remembered much beyond anything aside from the way he chose to exit.